If you don't know who I am, I am Di and I'm the lead pastor here and it's just been fun to see what God's been doing, the stories that he's starting to weave into us as a family, as a church and also as a community. So all that in-house stuff is really important to us that you know and over the next few weeks we're leaning into this finance thing because we believe God's a God who provides and so we want to just take it, take him seriously and say that SYG stuff with the games, did you see what we just did there? There's generosity amongst us. Did you see what happened for Sen? She got three jobs, did I hear that right? Two jobs, four jobs, lots of jobs. <laughs> and there are many of us that God is just taking us up a level. So welcome to the party of what that's going to look like as we go along. So you may not know, um, where I live in Croydon is a shared space. You know, Croydon, they've kind of done lots of subdivisions. And so I've got a house at the front, a shared driveway that goes all the way to the back, and another group of tenants that live at the back from another landlord. All right. So he's arranged all that. They're there. But this one driveway is shared. And this one driveway sometimes has cars parking in it, and I can't get in or out. It's really annoying. It's happened, I've been there for 15 years, lots of different tenants, different tenants appreciate and recognize and respect me in different ways. There was one season that it became a war. That shared driveway became a war. And they really didn't like me because I would knock on their door and say, I need to get into my garage because I want access to my home. I said it with a smile. They didn't like it because they had to move. It was inconvenient. They had to move their car out of our shared driveway. <laughs> Today, I just want to frame that, that we often have shared life and sometimes things are in the way. Sometimes we have things that it's access is stopped because of someone else's decision. And sometimes the way we treat that can be very patient but after 15 years of different tenants with different levels of respect, I've learned some skills. So I just want to share you some skills. Is that all right? Some skills about shared life, about shared driveways, about boundaries and protecting what's important. Like, I want to get to my house, please. It's important. I need to, especially when I've got groceries. All right. So, Lord, would you just now come and open up this space so that it's you that's teaching and it's you that's equipping us and it's you that's speaking. And if you can use my voice in a way that's going to just open up things for your glory, I say thank you in advance that you're here amongst us already. Amen. So often we'll talk about boundaries in our lives, wouldn't we? And some of you, this is just like 101, okay? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But boundaries in our lives are like you have property, like I do with my house, we have property that we want to protect. And boundaries, it's your job to protect what's valuable to you. It's not my job. What's valuable to you, that's your job to protect that. And so the boundaries that we put around our lives is because we value something. And so I valued access to my property. And so I made sure that I was communicating that in a way that it was my job to do that. It wasn't anyone else's job, even though I had friends that had ideas that could have helped me. I chose not to accept big trucks parked in the driveway for days. I chose not to accept their help because it was my responsibility, my property, right? So it's your job in your life to set up boundaries and to protect the things that are important, to protect your connection with God. That's your job. That's your job. To protect your connection with your spouse, your family, your friends, that's your job, to protect that connection. It's your job to manage your time. It's your job to manage your resources that God's given you. It's your job to manage your health, right? Ticking so far? Agreeing? Yeah? And it's also your job to manage communication. So you might have noticed that we are working really hard with you to communicate well because we feel like that's something that we really want to protect and value amongst us. And so you're hearing stuff, you're hearing current realities, and you're hearing things through the e-letter that's going on that you wouldn't see on a Sunday, because we want to communicate in a way that's protecting what we've got. All right? So some people would say it's a little bit like you have your own yard, 
all right? Sounds kind of American, but we'll say yard, all right? You have your own yard, and it's an inside place, and your individual yard is also your responsibility. And in that yard, you'll find, at times, attitudes in your yard, and you'll go, oh, what's in my yard? That's interesting, and you'll deal with your attitudes. And then you'll find there's also feelings, and you'll go, oh, that's a good feeling, or that's a bad feeling, oh, that's in my yard, that's mine, I have to deal with that. And so attitudes, feelings, and then choices, right? So that we, we all know this, Nod, don't we? We know this. So in your yard, there are things that you're responsible for. So what happens when a dashboard, something on your dashboard in your yard goes on and you're like, I've got really big feelings about something that's going on. And these really big feelings are creating an attitude in me and these attitudes are causing me to choose something, good or bad. Have you, anyone experienced that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happens when we come into a shared life where, like over the last few weeks, some of us have had our feelings go, ooh, I've got big feelings about stuff that's happened on Sundays, or I've got big attitudes that I'm aware is in my yard, and I'm making choices out of that. So that's, this is where we're coming from, okay? As we do shared life together, we're going to have our yards recognizing, oh, there's stuff going on in me. And you know what? As a pastor, I'm like, yes, this is awesome. Because we're actually identifying the reality of what's happening in our yard. And we've got boundaries around to protect it so that we know that we're going to be okay because Jesus is actually helping us to grow. And we're here as disciples to grow. And so that's the aim. So that's the 101 thing. Now, let's do <clears throat> the reason and the purpose that I'm saying this is because we are a church of powerful people because of who Jesus is in us. And we're a church with freedom. And so with this freedom, we're going to find that sometimes things will plop into our yard like a driveway with a car that doesn't give me access to what I normally have access to, right? And so I just want to talk us through what are some things that we can do in that situation, give you permission to say, oh, I've noticed something that's popped up for me, and find people in this community to actually grow together with that. Last week at the end of Greg's message, Greg Forbes spoke, we broke up into groups, and there were some people that actually chose to go to a group where people would think differently than them. They deliberately chose to go and sit with people that would think perhaps differently to their response to last week. That made me so proud because what's happening is we're actually going in with the ability to grow by learning and listening to the people next to you. So... What happens when, if we do another experiment, and we think of this church, Yarra Valley Vineyard. If you're visiting, welcome. Our boundaries are wide. <laughs> if you're visiting, we really hope that this is a, a helpful thing, even though it's a lot of family stuff. So think of our church and think of our boundary line. <clears throat> Try and picture, what's the boundary line for Yarra Valley Vineyard? You got a picture in your head? It's a little bit different to your own individual one, isn't it? Your boundary line, what's your imagination, what's your reality for this church? I wonder if some of you think just this space, that's our boundary line. I wonder if some of you think, ah, oh, it's this property because this is where we are, it's this location. I wonder if you think the boundary line is the Yarra Valley, our name, Yarra Valley Vineyard. Take note of what you think our boundary line is now, because in May 2019, we might find out by the end of 2019, our boundary line is different than we thought, because God's doing something new. And so it's not about this location, it's about you, and it's about our own yard. And some of what you're hearing with the finance stuff is we're actually taking responsibility for what's in our yard right now. So communication is in our yard. We want you to feel like we're communicating and we're listening to you guys because you're in our yard. You're with us. If you're wondering about the finance conversation, that's because you're in our yard. And it's a little bit like this. How many of you have been to Disneyland? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 
yeah, the party people. Over here? Yes, yes, yes. No, no. How many of you want to go to Disneyland? Yes. How many of you never want to go to that place? Yes. See, don't you love this church? I just love it. <laughs> many families have a goal to go to Disneyland. To get to Disneyland, sometimes it's a lot of planning because taking kids on a plane to America means money, right? So it also means time and it also means lots of planning, right? It's a little bit like that because, in fact, there was one family that said, we're going to call it Pigs Might Fly Project because they really weren't quite sure if they were going to get there. <laughs> and so this one family, they started to plan. They started to have meetings around the table as they're eating their meals. Where do you want to go in Disneyland? What do you want to do? And they started to dream and imagine, what's it going to be like when we get there? This one family, they had all their ducks in the row for the pigs might fly. See, metaphor, good, huh? <laughs> and what they did was they realized, huh, some of those rides, you can't go on it unless you're a certain height. Some of their kids, two of their kids, were going to be under that height. You know, there's a line, and they line up the kids and say, yes, you can go on, it's safe, safe. Two of these kids weren't able to go on the ride. They had a dilemma. Do we postpone our Disneyland trip until we can share it all together? as making memories, you know how families do, we want to do that, we want to make sure everyone's together, not separated, missing out, waiting, waiting, waiting while someone's on the ride, right? So they decided because two of their kids couldn't go, they would wait until the kids had grown to that height and then they went. It was a different trip because they could all do the rides together. We are in a little bit of a space like that as a church. We know growth is coming because that's what happens to healthy churches. We know God's going to add stuff to us, height, new levels of things that are going to be amazing, adventure. We know that. We are confident of that. That's why I'm here. Is that why you're here? We just know it. <laughs> and so this growth period of planning, like we've got big plans in our hearts I've got a whole journal of things in my heart that I've written down just to document. This is what I want to see for the people of God in this region. You've got different ways of documenting, knowing and praying into this stuff. But we're at a place where we could move forward or we could wait till everyone's ready for the ride. And there's some growth going on. So I just want to release that to you guys that there's Disneyland, the happiest place on earth is coming but we've got family stuff that's going on to get us to a place where everyone's going to be able to join the ride. And in fact, part of that growth, God wants to add people to us. There are people that are not here yet that are going to help us with that. And you're going to be so encouraged when they arrive. And so some of these declarations about finances, it's also because there's going to be other people joining us. Just like in Acts, God is going to add people to us. It's going to be great. So Disneyland's where we're heading. Happiest place on earth is where we're heading. We've just got some growth happening as well at the same time. Grow another inch, YVV. Grow another inch. Okay? Let's keep going towards what he's got for us. And like Rick said, at YVV, many, many people have already sewed into this church. That's why we're here for years. And we're riding on that promise that that's going to happen again. And if you don't know, I was there at the start, and there was no church when we came here. No YVV. And you're here now, 23, 24 years later, and we've got another wave coming. And we get to strap ourselves in, have our dinner parties, go to the pub and chat about our dreams, and know God's going to provide for us. <clears throat> so our Prime Minister, the first words out of his, ha out of his mouth was... I have always believed in miracles. How amazing. <laughs> whatever you're thinking and whatever your attitudes, feelings and choices are, yeah, some are celebrating, but we're celebrating the fact that our nation has voted and that's the first words that we heard from our Prime Minister. So we are also expecting, just as he is, 
that we're always going to believe in miracles. And so what might feel like, hmm, we are a different size church, I think our boundary lines expend, extend way beyond what we know. And here's why. Yes. Yes, Dave. For the recording, he said, God bless Australia. <laughs> John 3.16. If you're thinking what's ahead of us, this is what's ahead of us. This is where we are locking in for now. A verse that you all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. While we're in this growth stage, that's what we're anchoring into. That God so loved the world the world, our boundary lines, that he gave his only, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not die, but have eternal life. So, do we believe in Jesus? Are we loved? Do we have eternal life now? Has it started now? Yes. It started now. It's your life. It's your yard. What you do with it, it started now. It's our life. It's our shared life. What we do with it starts now. Eternal life. It's all about relationship. This message is called love. God loved the world to give. Love to give. And it's just coming because our finance team also wanted to talk about finances. I thought, yeah, let's talk about that in the scheme of what God is building for us. A while ago, one of our elders said, we're no longer attenders, we are contenders. And we are contending for something. And there is a resolve in us that is rising up that says, we're not here just to play church. We're actually contending for something. And the finance part's going to be an important part because we're going to see those numbers change. And a year later, when we put the slide up, before financial end of year, we're going to go, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Look what God has done. And you'll all be able to say, I was there a year ago. I saw that change. You know, you know too, we have an enemy. We have an enemy that is after the things in your yard that you're protecting. And we have an enemy that the Bible calls Satan that is actually opposing all this good life in you. So as you attend to your yard and take responsibility for it, as we attend to our yard and take responsibility for it, we can expect he's not going to like that. So I want to throw that in too because you need to be in community and not just a yard on your own. For what's coming and what we're contending for, you need to be somehow connected so that your yard is also protected by community and what God's doing among us. Did anything pop up in your yard as I said that? Any feelings? Any attitudes? Any choices? If you don't come back next week, I'll know that's your choice. <laughs> but we have started right now an eternal thing. We are part of something that's not going to end. It's kingdom. It's who we are and what we're made for. And many of you know I'm Leonie McCullum. Passed away, went home to Jesus on Thursday. Dave McCullum and his family are really feeling the support of God and others. She was already in eternal life before she left her physical body on Thursday morning. So we are celebrating the fact that she's home but we're grieving and missing who she is and what she would bring. And so, yeah, we just, um, let's remember them this week. Let's remember them as they, as a family, get used to the fact that their mum, their wife, their friend is no longer physically with us. My family this week had a tough week. How about yours? Did you have a tough week or a good week? Tough? Some? Happy week? Who had a happy week? Yeah, so every time we come and sit together in a room, there's all this mix going on. There's grief, there's loss, there's pain, and we welcome it all because we get to share life together. For God so loved the world that he gave. We share because he loved us, and then we give. So the intro is over. <laughs> Told you, five sermons. <laughs> Love to give, but we have looked at, you're responsible for your own yard, tick, 
all right? And you are also aware that we've put boundaries around things that we value and we communicate those boundaries. And as a church over the winter, we're going to actually look at some things that are really valuable to us. We're going to have testimonies. We're going to have guests coming and help speak into these things that we really value. And it's just going to be fantastic. And it's going to be all about the things that we protect and want to see grow. So that's going to be over the winter just to keep us all nice and warm inside as we go through the hardship of winter in Melbourne. As I move into this next phase, I just want to think about motivation. What motivates us? Particularly if you think there are external motivations and there are internal motivations that we deal with in terms of our yards. And one example that we have discovered recently in our conversations in leadership and elders is that Oh, tithing is one of those interesting things where in our yard we say the word tithing and for some people there's big feelings about that. For some people there are big attitudes about that. And for some people there are choices about that. And they're different among us all. And as part of that, if you're not sure what tithing is, tithing is in the Old Testament there was a law given to God's people to give 10% of their produce, to give 10% of anything that came from the earth, and it was all to go towards God, the first fruits, they called it. And then the people of God, they also dedicated to pay for three areas of tithes. It was tithes for the Levites that served God. It was tithes for the temple and feasts, great feasts. And the third thing was the tithe to the poor of the land. So that's what it is. And there's a lot of interesting perspective about that right now and part of that is because it's confusing right some people that didn't grow up in the church don't even know those things exist in the bible they haven't read that yet they haven't got to that it's confusing because some people that did grow up in the church got taught wrongly and so they've got reaction to that and fair enough because it was law it was external pressure and some people just don't care they don't that's not an important part of their yard it's not an important part of their responsibility. And some people are in the midst of all that. And sitting here today, many of us will be some of those three or four. So we're just going to have a conversation first. Because God loves us and he gave for us. And because we have an assignment to the world around us. So I felt like it kind of needs a conversation first. So that you can sort out in your yard what it is that you, you would like to talk to Jesus about in terms of tithing because it is confusing and we're going to start at different places and so this is not a message on tithing it's a beginning conversation in the confusion of it all you also discover that part of the confusion is people think the God of the Old Testament is really different to the God of the New Testament and so all of a sudden you discover it's confusing because they think there's angry God and then there's merciful God. And so that's also in our yards. I wonder if that's an attitude, a feeling and a teaching that you've had that you might need to just go, hmm, I need to dig into that a bit more because I kind of might feel like God's a bit angry in the Old Testament. But you know what? He hasn't changed. He's always had the same yesterday, today and forever nature. He is the God in the New Testament who is the God in the Old Testament. And what he's after is us, a people. A people who will wholeheartedly serve him, love him, and reveal him. That's who he's after. Say us. Us. He's after us and our whole hearts. And he's calling us to do things. And so it matters what your view of God is. It matters. It matters whether you have some work to do on whether you think an Old Testament God is different to a New Testament God in how you read your Bible. And there's lots of wonderful ways that you can help yourself process through that with conversation with Jesus and with others, life groups, study online, grab someone to disciple you, be intentional with it. But we're called to do things that he's asked us to do. And so when it comes to tithing, he's actually talked to us and instructed us through his word about that. And so that's one thing as we go ahead, how your view of God, Old Testament and God, New Testament is, it's going to be important 
going to be important. It matters because he desires to have a people that follow him with our whole heart and out of love because he's after your heart. And the truth is, we'll make it really clear, the truth is he's not after your money. He does instruct you to give first fruits, but he's not after it. He's after your heart, your whole heart. And you'll, you'll recognize even in the way that Anne um, led us today in, in our tithes and our offerings that we're doing it now at the end of our worship. Let me just find that bit because that's actually quite intentional for us. You'll notice that um, we started reading, where is it? Here it is. We started reading from 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, we were talking about the heart of our giving. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. Now, I'll, this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7, each one must do as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you've been around, you'll remember we've been using that verse because at the end of worship is a time where it's heart issue. We've just brought our love and our expression and our adoration. And so it's not an, intern an external motivation that we do something functional and let's bring the team forward. It's actually part of our expression of our worship because it's a heart issue out of love, right? And so some of these decisions that we're making, it's because we want to develop love and joy in our process of giving. We want to know how to celebrate that because it's coming from a heart place rather than from a place of we must do this. Does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, cool. Let me flip back to here. Bridget. <laughs> so external pressure looks like this. If you feel like we are ever putting external pressure on you, then your yard will feel it because the attitudes, the feelings, and the choices will come. Have a think about this. What's it look like when we take away limits, when we take away external pressure? If there were no longer policemen with a camera on the road, What's in your heart? How fast would you go? Turn to the person next to you and tell them what you would say. How fast would you go? If there's no external pressure. Well, in the Northern Territory, and I think, is Corey here? Corey or Talia? Where are they? They're here today. They were living in the Northern Territory. I haven't actually been on the roads that are, this is about, I'm about to tell you about. I've always flown into the Northern Territory. But in the Northern Territory, what do they have? Open speed zones, right? Yeah, so you can go as fast as your heart desires. But then they found out, oh, there's some external things that you might have lots of freedom to do that, but they realized, oh, on the roads are these big long road trains and there are <laughs> southerners with their caravans and there are all sorts of conditions that create that speed to be a bit hazardous. It's not very safe. The conditions of the road were not quite the same as they should be and so driving at 200 kilometers an hour actually was not safe. And so they pulled it back and said, we're just going to suggest this is the speed now. And so external pressure until that's taken away, you don't know what you're going to do, right? They have um, in Germany, what's it called? The Autobahn. Who's been on that? All those people with their hands, ask them later, what's that like with no speed limits? They're different there because they've actually provided something that's safe to drive on. So the conditions are perfect, pretty much. Germans, right? <laughs> so they would have well-maintained, well-policed, well-divided, multi-lane roads, not like the Northern Territory. External pressure is a way, and also the conditions work well for them. And they suggest, they have an advisory speed limit that you can go. My guess, because <laughs> I'm a bit more safe, would be just go to a racetrack and hire a car that's actually going to have a professional next to you and let your heart be content there, all right? And go as fast as you like. And many of you have done that as well. Because we need to say when there's no constraints, when there's no external pressure, what's the speed limit in your heart? It's the same with many issues in our yard. What's happening in your yard? You don't know until the external pressure is taken away. 
and it is then revealed what's in your heart when external things are not there. When we're not talking about finances, what's in your heart? What's God saying to you in your yard? We are motivated by the love of God. God loved us and he loves the world and we have an assignment for us. And so we want to know what's in our hearts and we want to do that together so that we can actually be honest with one another but we can also say, hey, I'm feeling external pressure there. Can we talk about that? Or we can say, ah, oh, Jesus has really convicted me and out of my relationship with him, this is how I want to respond. I'm using tithing because it's probably where we will go down the track but we're just opening up that conversation. I actually think that you might agree or you might not agree. Many pastors actually burn out because they're trying external tactics and there's no response. Have you seen that anywhere? I wonder. And it's merely external motivation and it's not sustainable. And so we're just saying we're in this together and we are going to bring every communication that we can and we're also going to say, what's in your yard? What's your choice? What's Jesus saying to you as we move together? Let me tell you about a church and their boundary and yard stuff, all right? So this was an environment that was in the country, and I was the youth leader. I know, who thought, who would have thought? <laughs> I was a bit younger then, and I was a young teacher, and I had lots of energy. <laughs> who would <have> thought? <laughs> and so I was the youth leader, and it was so much fun. And one day, I did all the right things, research, we're going to go to the movies together as part of our youth experience. And so... I chatted to all the parents, got permission, chose a really good movie. I did my research and made sure it was a okay movie. You know what I'm saying? It was all fun. And we went, and had to, we went to the movies. It was so great. Innocently, I took them. Didn't tell the pastors were doing that because I was the leader. <laughs> and I bumped into something in that church culture. I innocently bumped into something that was under the surface from a teaching that these, this leadership had from years ago that if you were in the movie theatre and Jesus came back, you'd go to hell. <laughs> yes, I bumped into that by accident after I went to the movies. So external pressure and the way they dealt with that was they took the youth leader into the prince I mean into the office <laughs> and they sat me down they didn't none of the parents were upset these people were though because they had a good heart that wanted to protect this youth group and me <laughs> from going to hell because they had been taught that if you contaminate yourself with the world, your heart will no longer be pure <laughs> and you go to hell. You'll go to hell. And that was their teaching. That was a church that Jesus lives in. And that was a leadership culture that I didn't know existed until I crossed that line and did something that I thought was just normal life. Now, <clears throat> external pressure means... I had to then leave their decisions and their teaching and I had to then go and look at my own yard attitudes, mm -hmm. feelings, lots of them, and choice. And I had to do my own work as a leader to say, huh, in this context, in this boundary, in this church, they're, they're, pro they're protecting a teaching that for me didn't feel free. It actually felt like a false view of God. I don't think Jesus would have turned up to that movie theater and said, sorry, he, that's not who I knew Jesus to be. And so I had a choice then. What was freedom in Christ going to look like for me? And how was I going to communicate that to my leadership? Who I felt like was believing something very, very different and expecting me to step into that as well. Now, I share that extreme model because... A lot of us have had that experience, right? And I can tell by your faces that you've all got lots of lunchtime conversation coming. Have lunch with someone and share your worst experience of where you've bumped into something that actually was a false view of God. 
we are looking for freedom in Christ. And so if there's any barriers that are in our boundaries, we want to know that Jesus is actually working on it with us and that we're going to be the freest place, powerful choices and amazing feelings and attitudes among us. And so... I love it when it's just a little ripple. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Can you feel the resolve in me, though? That's, I really want you to know that's where we're heading. And that's why as we grow, we feel like that we just need to grow an inch. And then we need to grow an inch. And some of that is we're learning how to do this in a free place where everyone gets to play and where it's, everyone is honoured and there's engagement of the heart there's engagement of the heart above any of our processes and procedures. That's how we want to motivate you. <laughs> because you're loved. Tick. And because we've got an assignment for the world. Checking. Sermon 3 over. No. <laughs> Let's quickly just turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 35, Jesus is talking to them and they're asking about the law. So I was in an environment that was very much based on the law that was not about relationship with Jesus when I'm telling you that example. The law is not a system that was set up to control or to punish or to manipulate, but the law is there because God has always been after our heart. Verse 35 in Matthew 22. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing Jesus. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He said to them, you shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your mind and your soul. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second like it is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And one of these, sorry, on these commandments, these two commandments, depend the whole law and the prophets. If you want to know what rests the law and the prophets together, if you want to know what depends on the whole law and the prophets, the entire law, love the Lord your God. The entire prophets, love the Lord your God. God is after a people. He's after a people. It's a relationship. He's not saying, I want you to do this because I'm more powerful than you and can control you and manipulate you. That was also a false view of God that many of us experienced if we've been in church for a long time, right? False view of God. He's saying, I long for my people. I long for them to love me and to be motivated from this place of the heart and to obey the things that I've given as a design for their life to flourish out of their heart. It's a place of love. We love him, we love God's people, and we love our community. Easy, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to stick with you guys. That's great. It's for our highest good, and it's exactly what he wants for us. So we're hoping that we're going to be in a place of joy in giving and a place where we're going to get to celebrate increase. So last story. What have I got? $50. If I get a letter in the mail from Vic Rhodes and they say, this year you need to give an extra $50. Am I going to be happy or sad in my yard? Grumble, grumble, grumble. Why do I have to give 50 extra dollars? Oh my goodness. It makes no sense. Oh, we know it's for a good reason, but heart would be saying, pretty unhappy about that. $50 extra, I'd be grumbling. If we come to church and we have an opportunity to get some youth to camp and we have $50 that Vic Rhodes doesn't yet have and we give to Jo and we stuff it in her pockets, <laughs> just like she told us, and then we have more money than we do have kids to get to that camp, so there's opportunity for more, that $50, is it going to be a place of joy or a place of grumbling? Yes, but not just for me, but for everyone that gets to participate and for us that are hearing the stories. So though, when we had the sense that the Lord was saying, we have volunteers that are really wanting to source and help with Stable One and the Winter Night Shelter, and we felt like the Lord said, let's just resource that in a little way that we can do. 
And so is it a Vic Rhodes moment or is it a joyful moment to actually serve those who are experiencing homelessness? Joy, because it comes from a place of love. We really love, our heart wants to see the best for those people. If we have a primary school in our area, these are all examples that are part of our story since I've only been here three months. This is part of our story. So I'm giving you relevant stories. And we say, oh, there's a primary school that has kids in need in families that actually they are in trauma. Some of them are living in cars and coming to school. And we're like, as elders, because of your generosity, we're thinking our church could change that situation in a moment. Our church could help those kids get off the street out of their car. And so we made a choice on behalf of you with our money in our hand that you had given to God's work to give to a local primary school. And they were blown away. We are supposed to take care of things. And that's when we're, why we're talking about finances because all our money together is much better than my one. There's some things I can do with my 50, apart from Vic Roads, that brings me joy. But when we bring together this little army of finance that comes from a place of love, we are a powerhouse. That's where we're heading so we can get to Disneyland and we're all at the same place of growth. Let's stand.